order. Questions to the Prime Minister. Kerry McCarthy. Yeah, 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 yeah. Question one, Mr Speaker. The Prime Minister. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Mr. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, I know that the thoughts of the whole House will be with all those caught up in the horrific incident in Strasbourg last night, and we stand ready to give whatever support the French authorities may need. Mr. Speaker, today I will have meetings, possibly many meetings, with ministerial <laughs> colleagues and others. Kerry McCarthy. So, just a normal day in the office, then, Prime Minister. <laughs> I would also want to share the condolences for the tragic events in the beautiful city of Strasbourg. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Last year, the Prime Minister told us that there wasn't going to be a general election, and then there was. This week, she told us she wasn't going to pull the meaningful vote, and then she did. Can I ask her now if she's going to rule out having a general election and a people's vote? Minister. Yes, can I, can I say to the Honourable Lady, first of all, that I think that a general election at this point in time would not be in the national interest in the middle of our negotiations. And secondly, and secondly, and secondly, as she will have heard me say before in this House, I think we should respect the result of the referendum that took place in 2016. And Nigel Mills, given what we could call uncertainty about the future of the withdrawal agreement. Could the Prime Minister give people some certainty, that's EU nationals in the UK, that whatever happens to that deal, they will be allowed to stay on roughly the same terms as are in that draft agreement? Well, my honourable friend raises an important point, because I know that EU nationals living here in the United Kingdom will be concerned about what might happen in the circumstances if a deal is not agreed. We've been very clear as a government. Obviously, the withdrawal agreement that we've agreed does uh, respect the rights and protect and guarantee the rights of EU citizens living here. But in the unlikely event of no deal, I've been clear that this government will still protect EU citizens' rights, and we would wish to, we wish to know would wish to know that actually other uh, EU governments would respect the rights of UK citizens living in the EU as well. Yeah. Jeremy Corbyn. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm sure the whole House will join me in joining, this, joining the Prime Minister in condemning the shootings in Strasbourg and extending our sympathy to the families of those that have been killed or injured there. Mr. Speaker, I'm delighted to see the Prime Minister back in her place after a little journeys. Having told the media this morning, having told the media this morning that she's made progress, can she now update the House on what changes she has secured? to her deal. Can I say to the right honourable gentleman, I did travel to Europe yesterday and meet a number of uh, heads of government and the Commission and the European Union Council. That's precisely because I had listened to concerns that were raised in this House and have taken those concerns to Europe. And no one, is in any, no one that I met yesterday is in any doubt about the strength of concern there is in this House on the issue of the duration of the backstop. But I'm, I'm interested that the Right Honourable Gentleman wants to know what progress uh, we have made, because actually the Right Honourable Gentleman couldn't care less what I bring back from Brussels. He's, he's being clear, he's being clear, whatever comes back from Brussels, he's going to vote against it, because all he wants to do is to create chaos in our economy. in our society and damage to our economy. That's Labour. That's Corbyn. Jeremy Corbyn. It's very clear, Mr Speaker, nothing has changed. Yeah. <laughs> if, she needed, if she needed any clarification, Mr Speaker, if she needed any clarification about the uh, temporary nature of the backstop, she needn't have gone to Europe. She could have just asked her Attorney General, who said it endures indefinitely. As the Prime Minister may recall, when she left, when she left on her journey, we were about to start day four of a five-day debate on the deal. Since the Prime Minister has not achieved any changes, either to the withdrawal agreement or the future partnership, 
Can she now confirm that we will have the concluding days of debates and votes within the next seven days yeah. before the House rises for the Christmas recess? I say to the right honourable gentleman, I had discussions with a number of people yesterday and I ha uh, have made some progress, but there is further. But of course there is an EU Council meeting. There are further discussions to be held. He asks about the meaningful vote. The meaningful vote has been deferred, and the date of that vote will be announced in the normal way. The business motion will be agreed and discussed in the usual way. But, well, well if he says when, I'll, I'll tell members on the other side when we've had a meaningful vote. We had it in the referendum on 2016. And if he wants a meaningful date, I'll give him one. 29th of March 2019, when we leave the European Union. Jeremy Corbyn! Totally and absolutely unacceptable to this House in any way. This House, this House agreed a programme motion. This House agreed the five days of debate. This House agreed when the vote was going to take place. The Government tried to unilaterally pull that and deny this House, deny this House the chance of a vote on this crucial matter. The Prime Minister and her Government have already been found to be in contempt of Parliament. Her behaviour today is just contemptuous of this Parliament and of this Mr Speaker, the Prime Minister's appalling behaviour needs to be held to account by this House, as indeed the people of this country are more and more concerned about the ongoing chaos at the centre of her government. When she made her Lancaster House... Order, order, order. Calm on both sides of the House. The quest order. The questions will be heard however long it takes, and so will the answers. Don't try to shout down. All you do is wear out your voices and you won't succeed. Amen. End of subject. Jeremy Corbyn. Mr Speaker, when the Prime Minister made her Lancaster House speech, she set out her negotiating objectives, and they're worth looking at and quoting. The first objective is crucial. We will provide certainty wherever we can. Does the uh, current situation look or feel like certainty? Can the Prime Minister mark her own homework on this matter? Yeah. <laughs> and indeed we have, at every stage. At every stage. Uh, the Right Honourable Gentleman said we wouldn't get agreement in December. We did. He said we wouldn't get the implementation period in March. We did. He said we wouldn't get a withdrawal agreement and a political declaration. And we, uh, and we did. Concerns... Concerns have, been raised, concerns have been raised about the backstop, and as I said, we continue those discussions, and no one yesterday was left in any doubt about the strength of feeling in this House. But of course, we all know what the right honourable gentleman's answer to the backstop is ignore the referendum and stay in the European Union. If there's an agreement, why won't the Prime Minister put that agreement to a vote of this House? The Federation of Small Businesses says that planning ahead is impossible. Many, many other people around this country find planning ahead impossible because all they see is chaos at the heart of government yeah. and an inability to plan anything for the future. Yesterday, the cross-party select committee, including Conservative MPs for the Committee for Departing, Exiting the European Union, unanimously found the Prime Minister's deal, and I quote, fails to offer sufficient clarity or certainty about the future. Will the Prime Minister give the country at least some certainty and categorically rule out the option of no deal? Yes. The, the way to ensure there is no no deal is to agree a deal. That's the way you ensure there is no deal. But the, the right, the right honourable gentleman, the right honourable gentleman talks about the impact on businesses. I'll tell him what will have an impact on businesses up and down this country. What we learnt just a few days ago, that the shadow chancellor wants to change the law so that. So order, order. The Prime Minister's reply must be heard, and it will be. The Prime Minister. 
Businesses will be affected by the fact that the Shadow Chancellor wants to change the law so that trade unions in this country can go on strike in solidarity with any strike anywhere in the world. That's not, that may be solidarity with trade unions. It's not solidarity with small businesses, and it's not solidarity with the ordinary working people who would pay the price of labour. Speaker, my question was, would the Prime Minister rule out no deal? She has failed to do that. Can I tell the Prime Minister this sorry saga is frustrating for businesses, for workers, and many actually behind her as well. Many, though, are trying to work constructively to find a solution. Yesterday, Yesterday, her former Brexit minister said a new customs union with the EU could be the basis for a parliamentary consensus. Absolutely. When is she going to start listening to people that want actually to find a constructive solution to this, rather than denying Parliament the right to debate it and vote on her deal? Well, well we all know one group of people that don't want to find a constructive solution. It's the Labour Party from there. On the other side, that's what we see on the other side of, uh, of the chamber. No plan, no clue, no Brexit. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, the time for dithering and delay is over. The Prime Minister, the Prime Minister has negotiated her deal. She is. The right honourable gentleman will be heard, Jeremy Corbyn. Mr. Speaker, the time for dithering and delay by this government is over. The Prime Minister has negotiated her deal. She's told us it's the best and only deal available. There can be no more excuses, no more running away. Put it before Parliament and let's have the vote. Whatever happens with her Conservative leadership vote today, it is utterly irrelevant to the lives of people across our country. It does nothing to solve the government's inability to get a deal that works for the whole country. She's already been found to be in contempt of Parliament. Will she now put this deal before Parliament and halt this escalating crisis which is so damaging to the lives of so many people in this country? We all know from the multiplicity of changes in plan we've seen from the Labour Party, there's one thing we can be sure about, that whatever U-turn comes next in Labour's policy, he'll send out... He'll send out uh, order. I said a moment ago the Leader of the Opposition must be heard, and belatedly he was. And the Prime Minister will be heard. The Prime Minister. Whatever, whatever change in Labour policy we'll see, he sent out his henchman to reveal it all to the world, the inconstant gardener. Yeah. Can I... <laughs> The right honourable gentleman. Can I say to the right honourable gentleman, I think it's time. Somebody will explain it to the leader of the opposition a little bit later. I, can I say to the right honourable gentleman? Can I say to the right honourable gentleman that he should be honest with people? He should be honest with people about his position. He couldn't care less about Brexit. What he wants to do is bring down the government, create uncertainty, sow division and crash our economy. The biggest, the biggest threat, the biggest threat to people and to this country isn't leaving the EU. It's a Corbyn government. Mr. Turn. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. A few weeks ago, Ben McKenzie from Neilston, a pupil at Eastwood High School, took his own life, having been the victim of cruel online threats and bullying on social media and his mobile phone. He was just 13 years old. 
Nearly £10,000 has been raised in his memory for Beautiful Inside and Out, a Scottish charity that supports the families of victims of child suicide. But can the Prime Minister set out what this government is going to do to tackle cyberbullying, not just to support and empower victims, but to deter and prevent children who may be engaging in these acts, not realising the consequences they can have? Because no family should be enduring a Christmas without their child due to suicide. Well, can I say to my honourable friend, he has raised an extremely serious issue, and I'm sure uh, the thoughts of the whole House and the condolences of the whole House are with uh, Ben's family at this terrible time and this terrible tragedy that has occurred. And as I say, he's raised an incredibly serious issue because this question of cyberbullying is one that we do need to address in both ways, as he says, both working with the uh, uh, internet companies in relation to uh, what is put out on their, their platforms, with working with schools to help people to be able to recognise this material and to deal with it, but also to support those children who could, as uh, my honourable friend said, be the victims and who might be, or those children who might be carrying out these attacks. And, uh, what our consultation showed last year on internet safety was that despite a range of voluntary initiatives and good work by a range of charities, and I commend the work of the Scottish charity Beautiful Inside and Out and the amount of money that's been raised, this does remain a serious issue for millions and people, millions of people. I know the Scottish Government has been addressing this with their respect for all approach. We are looking, working, funded the UK Safer Internet Centre. That's providing guidance for schools. But this is an issue we should all take very seriously and the Government will continue to work on this. Yeah. Ian Blackford. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Can I associate myself with the remarks of the Prime Minister on cyberbullying and indeed on the terrible tragedy yesterday in Strasbourg? Uh, Mr Speaker, we were promised strong and stable. (laughs) We were promised a vote on the Brexit deal. But this Prime Minister can't even do her own job because of the Tory civil war. This government, Mr Speaker, is an embarrassment. Christmas is just two weeks away. Will the Prime Minister bring forward her meaningful vote on the Brexit deal next week? week? No. As I say, there are discussions that we're having with uh, European leaders and others, and those discussions will continue. I think what matters, what matters is that they are in no doubt about the strength of feeling about this issue on the duration of the backstop in this House. They are in no doubt about the strength of feeling in this House that that should be addressed in a way that has legal force. Uh, and that is what we are uh, discussing and continuing to negotiate with the European Union. As I said earlier, the date of, that, uh, the date of the, uh, deferred uh, vote on this, the date of the, uh, the debate on this, will be announced in due course in the normal way. Ian Blackford. Mr Speaker, that is contemptuous of Parliament. Parliament voted for a meaningful vote. We should be having the vote, and it should be happening next week. This government is a farce. The Tory party is in chaos. The Prime Minister is a disgrace with their actions. The reality is that people across Scotland and the UK are seeing this today. Prime Minister, take responsibility. Do the right thing. Resign. Can I I just say to the right honourable gentleman, he claims that uh, he makes the remarks he does about the deference of the, deferring the vote. But of course, it is precisely because I have listened and colleagues in government have listened to the views of people across this House that we are pursuing this issue further with the European Union. That is being respectful of the views that have been raised in this House. Mark Palsy. Thank you, Mr. Yeah. Speaker. Um, many businesses up and down the country have put their future plans on hold, waiting for us here in Parliament to agree our future trading relationship with our biggest and closest neighbour. Does the Prime Minister agree that their interests and those of their workers and their suppliers and the country as a whole are best served by concluding the agreement with the remaining 27 and, on this side, supporting her in the vote this evening? I, I, I thank, for my, uh, I thank my honourable uh, friend for his comments and, and uh, uh, agree with him, particularly that we need to ensure that we do not uh, increase uncertainty and create more uncertainty. And we, the public voted to leave the EU. They want us to secure a deal that delivers on that result. And we shouldn't risk handing control of the Brexit negotiations to opposition MPs in Parliament, because that would mean risking delaying Brexit or even stopping Brexit. None of that would be in the national interest. So I think.
think we need to get on and deliver a good Brexit for the country. Lily yeah. Reeves. When I stood for election, I vowed not to vote for any Brexit deal that was not in the best interests of Lewisham West and Penge. By pulling the Brexit vote, the Prime Minister must now concede that her deal is doomed. The House and her own party appear to have no confidence in her. But will she have confidence in the people and give them a say with a people's vote, including an option to remain in the EU? To the Honourable Lady, we have deferred the vote on the agreement uh, and on the, the issue that she raised about putting uh, the vote back to the people. Can I say to her, as I have said, as I said to the first uh, questioner, uh, the uh, Honourable Member from Bristol, and have said in many occasions in this House, this House put its faith in the votes of the people of this country when we gave them the referendum, decided to give them the referendum in 2016. People voted to leave the European Union. It is now our duty to deliver on that. Uh, Mr Speaker, this House has a duty to make sure that the next generation live better lives tomorrow than we live today. So how does my right hon. Friend respond to the Royal College of Obstetricians and Gynaecologists audit that found that three quarters of the hundreds of babies who die or suffer brain damage each year could be saved by better care? And what steps is the government taking to ensure that every expectant mother and unborn baby receives appropriate monitoring? Well, can I thank my honourable friend for raising what I know is a very important issue and one that is close to the hearts, I know, of many members of this House. And every death or injury of a child is a tragedy. And we, we have a commitment to halving rates of stillbirth, neonatal deaths and brain injuries after birth by 2025. And that's supported by system-wide action under our national maternity safety strategy. We're increasing midwifery training places by 25 per cent. We're investing millions of pounds in training for staff and in new safety equipment to ensure that the NHS can provide world-class care for mothers and babies. But we recognise uh, that this is something that we need to ensure that we continue to do all we can, and I can give my honourable friend the reassurance we will do. Matthew Pennycook. Thank you, Mr Speaker. As she reflects on her premiership, can I ask the Prime Minister which of the following misjudgments she most regrets? Laying down red lines before the Brexit talks had even begun? Wasting precious negotiating time on a general election? Or consistently failing to face down the hardliners on her own benches and reach out to forge a consensus in this House and the country? I'll tell the honourable gentleman the judgment that was the right one. It was to accept the vote of the people in the referendum, to deliver on the vote of the people in the referendum, and to deliver a good Brexit for the future of this country. Damien Moore. Mr Speaker, small businesses are the backbone of my Southport constituency. The Chancellor announced in the budget a right revitalisation fund for our high streets. Can I ask my right honourable friend when that will be made available, as it will prove a vital lifeline to my constituency because of the anti-business policies of Labour-controlled Sefton Council? Well, can, I, can I say to my honourable friend, can I thank him for highlighting the help that we've announced to, for the High Street, and he's absolutely right. The Leader of the Opposition may stand up and, and claim to be interested in businesses and small businesses, but so often we see the action of Labour councils up and down the country actually doing exactly the opposite. Uh, that's, we have provided £675 million in the Future High Streets Fund uh, and to, so that plans can be made to help to make high streets and town centres fit for the future, and we'll be publishing a prospectus for the fund shortly. Catherine West. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Can the Prime Minister confirm which is worse, no deal or no Brexit? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, can, I, can, I say, can I say to my honourable friend, I think it is important that we do deliver on Brexit for the, people of this, uh, for the people of this country. I believe that we should do that with a good deal with the European Union. I believe that is what we have negotiated. And I do believe, as my honourable friend from a said, said from a sedentary position, that actually the worst thing for this country would be a Labour government. Yeah. Uh, Mr Kenneth Clark. Uh, Mr yeah. Speaker, yeah. at a time of uh, grave national crisis on an issue which we all agree was huge importance to future generations, uh, can my right honourable friend think of anything more unhelpful, irrelevant and irresponsible than for the Conservative Party to embark on weeks of a Conservative yeah. leadership yeah. election? Yeah. Can I say 
to, can I say, my, my right hon. Right and learned friend has raised an important issue. And I think it is, it is the impact that those weeks of that campaign would have on the decision that the House has to take and the decision that we have to take as a country in relation to leaving the European Union, because there is no doubt that would go beyond, beyond the legislative date of the 21st of January, and it would mean that the, a new leader, were a new leader to come in, that the, one of the first things they would have to do would be to either extend Article 50 or rescind Article 50, and that would mean either delaying or stopping Brexit. Siobhan? Uh, away from the madness of her own MPs, can I welcome the Prime Minister back to the real world? Last week, Marion was forced to queue outside St George's Hospital Tooting with a badly infected left leg because the A&E was full. Knowing my constituents, can the Prime Minister tell me how long will that queue be should the local NHS get its way and move the a and &E at St Helier Hospital to leafy, wealthy Belmont? Well, can I say to uh, the Honourable Lady, obviously I'm very concerned to hear the case that, that she has raised of, of her constituent. Um, the decisions, it's absolutely right that decisions on delivery of services should be taken by local clinicians, because they, they are best placed to assess local need. Now, I understand that what the local NHS is doing is looking at the very uh, considerable challenges that are being faced by Epson and St Helier Trust and looking at options for future services, but these are at a very early stage. And I, knowing, knowing the Honourable Lady, as I do, from uh, past experience when we shared, uh, both sat on Merton Council together, I am sure that she will continue to raise the concerns of her local constituents, and I would encourage her to do so. Julian Knight. Thank you, Mr hey, Speaker. Yeah, 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 yeah. Surely 34,000 copies of Your Money Matters, a free personal finance textbook, will wing their way to every secondary school in the land. Will my right and all friend join me in saying thank you to its funder, the broadcaster Martin Lewis, yeah, yeah. Young Money, the organisation behind it, the APPG for Financial Education and Young People, which I chair, and not least the Department of Education for making this fantastic resource for our young people happen. Yeah. Yes. Can I, can I say to my honourable friend, I think he's done a very important thing today by raising people's awareness of this booklet, which I think will be extremely important for uh, secondary schools. I think this is a really good piece of work. I congratulate all those who are involved, and I know this is an issue that my honourable friend, through his chairmanship of the APPG, has taken very seriously, has been championing for a long time. And I hope he's pleased to see this piece of work being done. I'm sure he'll want to carry on to ensure that there is that financial education taking place so that young people are prepared for their future lives. Mary Cray. Mr Speaker, the economy is stalling, business investment is falling, and we have the grotesque... Order. 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 I couldn't care less what somebody chuntering from a sedentary position says is or isn't the truth. What I care about is that the Honourable Lady will not be shouted down any more than any other member in this place will be shouted down. Be quiet and listen. Mary Cray. The economy is stalling. Business investment is plummeting, and we have the grotesque spectacle of Tory MPs putting party interest before the public interest. Yeah. If she survives tonight's vote, will she finally rule out no deal, face down her hard Brexiteers, let this place vote down her deal, and put it back to the public in a people's vote? Yeah. Can I say to the, the Honourable Lady, first of all, the way to, in, if she wants to ensure no deal, the way to ensure no deal is to agree a deal. That is the best way to ensure that there is not no deal. That's the way to ensure that it is not no deal. But she talks about the economy. She talks about the economy. Employment is at a record high. Wages, wages are growing, and we've had 23 consecutive quarters of growth, the longest run in the G7. That's a balanced approach to the economy. That's Conservatives delivering for the people of this country. Sir Patrick McLaughlin. Can I, can I ask my right honourable friend? to take her mind back to September 97, when a referendum was held in Wales. The result of that referendum was 50.3% in favour of an assembly and 49.7% exactly. against, on a turnout of 50%. Nobody questioned whether we should accept the referendum. Does that hold any future reference for us? 
Can I thank my right honourable friend? He's made a very important point. And he's made a very important point about the principle that was accepted at that time, which was however small the margin in the vote, it was the overall result of the vote that should be accepted and acted on. Jill Furness. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Last week I hosted an event to raise money for Radio Hallam FM's Mission Christmas, a charity doing fantastic work helping children in need in my constituency and for the local food banks. Indeed, many of the 41% of children living in poverty in my community will really need help this Christmas. What message does the Prime Minister have for those who are working hard to make ends meet but will find themselves forced to rely on food banks for their family's Christmas meal and mission Christmas for their children's presents? Yeah. Yeah. Can, I, can I, first of all, and obviously um, say how good it is that Radio Hallam has been doing this work. There are many charities up and down the country who do do work to ensure that they can provide uh, a, a better Christmas for many children than they would otherwise have. Uh, that is important. We don't want to see, we don't want to see people be, you know, relying on food banks, but the way, to in, the way to ensure that people are able to provide for themselves without having to rely on food banks is to ensure that people are in work, that that work is well paid and that work always pays, which is exactly what we're doing. Maggie Throop. Yeah. Residents in Arawash are clear that we need a strong government to deliver on Brexit and on the domestic agenda. Does my right honourable friend agree that it's time for us to unite on these benches as the real threat to our great nation is the party opposite and the Labour government? Yeah. Can, I, can I echo the comments that my honourable friend has made? I think that many people, many members of the public want us to get on with Brexit and actually ensure that we are delivering for them on the domestic agenda, like the record number of homes, new homes that we have seen being built, the, the best number ever uh, bar one year in the last 31 years. It is getting on to that domestic agenda that is important. To do that, we must unite as a party and bring our country back together again, which is absolutely right. The greatest threat to the jobs and livelihoods and futures of her constituents and constituents around the United Kingdom would be a Labour government. In Fletcher. Yeah. Yeah. Last month, in my constituency, a 16-year-old boy was tragically killed in a knife attack. This came as knife crime has almost doubled in Coventry over the last five years. I know that some good multi-agency work is happening in this field, but does the Prime Minister still think we have enough police officers on our streets to be able to fight crime and the fear of crime? Can I first of all extend my condolences to the family? of the constituent that the Honourable Lady has referred to, who has suffered from this terrible attack. Uh, can I also say that, have, obviously, there is a concern, and I recognise the concern about the rise in violent crime. It's why the Government has produced the Serious Violence Strategy. Uh, the Serious Violence Task Force take, has people from across uh, the, the uh, House in, uh, sitting on that, across party bases sitting on that. It's why we've given extra powers to the police to tackle knife crime. Through, we're giving that through the Offensive Weapons Bill, and we've strengthened firearms control through the Policing and Crime Act. And uh, in relation to this, this isn't just about police action. Actually, we've uh, announced the 200 million Youth Endowment Fund, which will be about helping to work with young people who otherwise might find themselves drawn into gangs and the use of knives to prevent them from doing that and to prevent these crimes from taking place in the first place. Sir David Evanert. Thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah. Does my right hon. Friend share my concern and my constituents' concerns about the further delays and increased costs of Crossrail and the failures of TfL and the Labour Mayor, Mayor of London? Yeah. Well, I, I, I absolutely share uh, my hon. Friend's concerns and his constituents' concerns, and indeed my constituency is affected also by the delay of Crossrail. And yes, we should recognise the role that TfL and the Labour Mayor of London has played yes. in this. We want to see Crossrail. It's going to be a benefit to my honourable friend's constituents and mine. And the Labour Mayor needs to get his finger out on this. Yeah. Jim McMahon. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. In 1997, the British Prime Minister issued an apology to the people of Ireland for the historic role in the Great Famine, a famine that saw a million people died and a million people displaced from their homeland. That sent out a powerful and an important message. 
Will the Prime Minister condemn any notion, any suggestion Absolutely. that food shortages in Ireland will be used to strengthen Britain's negotiated hand during the Brexit negotiations? I say, can I say to the honourable gentleman, I am happy to absolutely give that assurance. We would not use that issue in any sense in the negotiating strategy. We want to work with the Irish Government to ensure that we are providing a good Brexit for the UK, a good Brexit for Ireland, and I believe that will be a good Brexit for the European Union. Neil O'Brien. Thank you, Mr Speaker. One of my constituents in Erdby has written to me to say, I voted for Brexit and I urge you to support our Prime Minister unreservedly and vote for this Brexit deal. The Prime Minister has done a terrific job in trying circumstances. The headbangers from all sides and the supine attitude of the Labour Party has meant she's had an impossible job, but she's done so well. And finally, a third from Saddington writes, I'm an employer of 30 people in the Harbour constituency. To vote against the deal will cause political chaos and open the door to the worst possible scenario for this country, a far-left Labour government. Does the Prime Minister agree with me that my constituents have got a lot more common sense than the members opposite? who want to stop Brexit and fundamentally damage our democracy. I think, I think, Mr Speaker, I think, Mr Speaker, this can be an occasion where I give a very short answer. Yes. Rachel Masco. Mr Speaker, the self-serving chaos unleashed on this parliament this week is emblematic of the way this government have consistently treated the people of our country. In the light of the Prime Minister's conduct, the pound has fallen 2% over the last 48 hours. Her budget's equivalent of running the entire NHS for six weeks. Does the Prime Minister believe that this is a price worth paying for her Brexit deal? She talks about what the government is doing for the NHS. It is this government that is establishing a 10-year plan for the sustainability of the National Health Service, and it is this government that is putting the biggest cash boots in its history into the National Health Service to ensure it is there for all our constituents now and in the future. Andrew Salou. Does the Prime Minister agree that we all owe a huge debt of gratitude to our police officers, prison officers and probation staff who are in the front line of keeping us all safe, the first duty of any government. In that regard, could I please ask the Prime Minister to take a close and personal interest in the 2019-20 police funding settlement? First of all, can I agree with my honourable friend? I think we do owe an enormous debt of gratitude to all those who are on the front line putting themselves potentially at risk for us, that is police officers, but he's also referenced prison officers and I think probation officers he referenced as well. Um, and I can assure him that I have been looking at, with the Home Secretary, as he has at the 2019-20 uh, police funding settlement. And Caroline Lucas. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The plotters behind her know that any replacement Prime Minister would face exactly the same party arithmetic and exactly the same deadlock on Brexit. This deadlock can only be changed by going back to the people. The Times newspaper today also said it's her only chance of saving her job and saving her deal. So can she tell the House what exactly is she afraid of? Can I say to the Honourable Lady? The issue is the issue is that this House overwhelmingly voted to give the choice to the British people as to whether or not to leave the European Union. The British people chose to leave the European Union, and I strongly believe that it is the duty of members of this House to deliver on that vote. Not in rake. Thank you, Mr Speaker. What does the Prime Minister consider to be most important? Playing parliamentary parlour games in this place or protecting jobs and businesses by going back to the negotiating table and thrashing out a deal that will pass through this House. Yeah. Well, can I say to my honourable friend, I think it is in the interests, in the interests of employers, in the interests of people whose jobs are at stake in this to make sure that we get a good deal with the European Union and that's why it's important that I uh, was in Europe yesterday and will continue to be in Europe doing exactly as he says, negotiating the deal that I believe can uh, get the support of this House to ensure that we can move forward and deliver a good Brexit. Finally, Sir Vincent Cable. Does does the uh, Prime Minister judge that it is more welcome or more appropriate 
to face a no-confidence motion from her backbenchers or from the Leader of the Opposition. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I say to the Right Honourable Gentleman, uh, that, that, that is not... Obviously, we have one of those which is going to, uh, to take place. What I, what I think is important for everybody in this House is to recognise that we have, a, I believe, a solemn duty to deliver on the result of the referendum in 2016. I believe the best way of doing that is with a good deal, with a good Brexit deal with the European Union that protects jobs and honours the referendum, and I believe that's the deal we've negotiated. Order.